Hi, I'm Paul Holmgren. Hey, I'm Travis Konechny. Hi, I'm Chuck Fletcher. Hey, this is Jeremy Roenick. Hi, this is Travis Sanheim. Hi, I'm Joel Fairby. Hi, this is Derek Broussard. Hey, I'm Scott Lawton. Hi, this is Bob Clark. And hey, you're, you're listening, listening to, to Snow the Goalie. 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 Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into a new year. New year, same show. Welcome into Snow the Goalie, the only Flyers podcast, the People's Podcast, the Players Podcast, Prognosticators Podcast, Peter Light Podcast, Campers Podcast, the only Flyers podcast. A new year. You would think that by now somebody else would have started a Flyers podcast, but here we are. We still stand alone as the only one. If you don't get the joke too bad, I, I guess. Uh, welcome back in. We have a lot to talk about. The Flyers, I don't know if you knew this or not, the Flyers are pretty much a playoff team. Everything's hunky-dory, and Anthony is doing uh, cartwheels while Bundy and I uh, considered not even showing up for the uh, the episode today. So a uh, lot to get into. Didn't know, but all of a sudden the Flyers are a Stanley Cup contender. Things are great. We'll be breaking it down. And we have a few other things, uh, especially Carter Hart said something was a joke after uh, the most recent game. And so uh, we have to dive into that as well. There's plenty to talk about. And of course, Keith Yandel as well, the number one defenseman in all of hockey. We'll be getting into that very shortly. But first, before we get started, Happy New Year. I think this is like the seventh year now. It's not. It's like fourth, fifth. New year that I get to ring in with Anthony Sanfilippo. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Ant San Philly. Hey, fella. Hey, how you doing, Russell? Besides, uh, you know, making stuff up, you know, sitting there saying that I think that everything's hunky dory. I, I don't know where you got Who that. Said that. Hey, did I say oh, Anthony right. said it's hunky dory? I didn't say that. Didn't say that. You did. Get me. You did. Let's roll you the did. tape back, Bundy. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, um, hey, we're on I'm video, wonder- by the way. Those of you, I forgot to say this off the top, but you can find this video, of course, over on the YouTube channel uh, for Crossing Broad, youtube.com slash Crossing Broad in the Snow the Goalie channel. Go ahead, back to you. Thanks, thanks, Russ. Appreciate it. Yeah, you typical of you just always you know, stepping over me to speak while uh, while I have something to say. But that's all right. No, it's and while we're good. talking about good. that, let's make sure that people follow this. Happy New Year, Russell. <laughs> Happy New Year. It's good to How see was you. New Year's? Did you have a good New Year? You know what? It was kind of quiet. Um, although then Mar- Maria looked at me at, at, uh, at, I guess it was like um, 10 o'clock and she said, let's go to media. They do it. So in, in media PA, um, they do a, a ball drop. So let's go watch the ball drop in media. And I'm like, all right. So we went out there and you know, we're standing outside. Probably, I don't know, close to a thousand people in media. It was, it was pretty crowded. Um, and as the ball's coming down, I look up and I say, it, it, they mistimed this. This isn't going to make it. And she's like, oh, no, it's going to make it. It's going to make it. I'm like, no. New year, and the ball was still dropping. <laughs> so typical Delco, typical uh, you know, way to ring in the new year and have it go have it go wrong. So that was how I started my 2022. Yeah. Got to hate that, that, Russ. <laughs> well, so does that mean that if, like, you're late to stuff now, you, you give yourself, like, a 30-second window and say the ball was late in media? Like, yeah, how- the ball was late. I, I'm just going by that, you know? Yeah. Media's ball was dropped a little later that's you know when up in up in pottsville we would uh you would do the the lowering of the yingling lager bottle so yeah there's that anyway let's go over to our co-host our friend our pal coming to us from his kitchen for this episode new year new year's resolution coming from the kitchen chris terrian bundy how you doing follow him on twitter at c terrian six just wanted to give you guys a look at the fridge behind me. It's a little bit packed in here today that, you know, people are home because of this, you know, this, uh, this viral illness that's going around the planet. And uh, so I've had to limit my, my space. So I've used the kitchen today and it feels very, very homey. I'm hoping the stool I'm sitting on does not break mid show. Uh, if it does, it will make for great video. I can assure you of that. Happy new year guys. Great to be back. Uh, what a, what a crazy, crazy ass two weeks. This has been uh, in life. And certainly what we cover, sports. And I know we'll be talking a lot about it today, but man, what an absolute mess this has turned out to be for, hey, for sports in general. Yeah, all, all sports, really. But I mean, if you, if you really want to look at the hockey, maybe we should start off with this, Russ. Um, yeah. The Flyers lose again last night. That's 4-1. to one. They lose the Ducks. Three straight losses, two in regulation. Um, you know, they're still kind of lingering just outside of that last playoff spot. But Boston's got four games in hand. If they win those four games, the Flyers will be buried at that point. Um, uh, so there's, you know, there's still time to tell on that. But I, I think the most important thing that kind of comes out of the game last night, obviously, Claude Giroux and uh, Ivan Provorov go into the COVID protocol um, mere hours before the game was scheduled to start. Um, Flyers had to recall three players from the from the taxi squad, which are basically AHL players. Uh, to which, come by the way, we have not even talked about on this show 
since it happened that the league has reinstituted taxi squads because that's Tempor- that's temporarily in in, yeah. in terms of like how the NHL protocol is working versus other leagues continue. Sorry. Yeah. So they had to recall three players from there. And, and you know, so you're going against the, the Ducks. Meanwhile, the Ducks also they had they were missing all four NHL quality centers. Um, all their guys were like if this game wasn't the last time the Flyers were heading out to the West Coast they would have rescheduled this game. Or if this was a game that happened before the Olympic decision did not play, they would have canceled this game and rescheduled it at some point down the line. But it didn't matter that each team was missing about six players. They said, ah, go out there and play anyway. Phantoms versus Gulls. Um, And, uh, you know, Flyers lose four to one. Um, And then Carter Hart, who was his first game back in, in nearly three weeks after he was, he was sick with the flu, did not have COVID. He had the flu. And the, and the NHL would have been okay with Carter Hart wandering those halls if he felt well enough to, to be there um, with the flu where he could have infected his teammates and fellow coaches and staff members, et cetera. They would have been perfectly fine with that because he was negative on COVID. He recovered from the flu. And when he was right, just about ready to rejoin the team at practice and he's feeling good again, he tests positive for COVID. Asymptomatic, doesn't have any symptoms. And then he has to quarantine in his home for the last, you know, 10 days. So therefore, Carter Hart had not played for three weeks. Goes out and plays last night, first time in three weeks. And he was fine. I mean, you know, he gives up the th- he gives up three goals. Um, he, I, w- I don't sit there and say any of them are bad goals by the goalie. I think that Carter Hart actually played a decent game. But after the game, he's asked about, you know, how challenging it is to, to get back out there and play a game when you find out that, your leading scorer and your top defenseman, even though he hasn't been playing like a top defense, but your top defenseman minutes wise um, are, are going to suddenly be in place in the protocol and not be available mere hours before the game. And Carter Hart came out and called it what the NHL is doing an absolute joke. He basically said that we have guys who don't have any symptoms who are sitting in protocol and they're not able to play. And the league has to fix this because what we're doing is we're either canceling games or we're having games being played where teams are really shorthanded and it's just, it's a bad product. It's bad for the teams. It's bad for the fans. It's bad for the sport. It's a joke. I I tend to agree with them. And I think, I think I know where you guys are going to be. I don't think we're going to get much in the way of disagreement, but you know, I'll, I'll throw it to you first, Bundy. Like, you know, it's good that finally that there's a player who's coming out and saying, we know what Eiserman, we talked about this last time we were on, that Eiserman made a suggestion about this, but this was the first time it was actually really, really criticized by a player with Carter Hart calling it a joke. You know, it's been a, it's been a tough almost two years, right? Like this pandemic is no joke. And I think everybody realizes that what did the, the first variant with the Delta and, and half the lives it took. Anthony, you were, you were bedridden. It was real. I had it for almost three weeks. I had a, what it was called long COVID. Uh, I'm vaccinated. I think most people are. Um, so the understanding of what happened, we get. We totally get. It. Now that it's moved on and there's a different variant, and we're getting different stories all over the place. I wholeheartedly agree with what Carter Hart said last night. Here's a here's a deal. And I know there's people out there that are that are terrified and 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 they've had experiences with it. Maybe a family member's perished, and it's it's that serious to them. The bottom line is this: there are pro sports leagues in this country that are going to carry on whether people like it or not, right? Like there's people, there are real serious people out there that actually think there should be no sports played at all. There should be no people going out in public at all. Well, that's not realistic in the real world, right? Like we have to live our lives. We have to learn to live with these things. If you can't um, isolate for a period of time until this is either eradicated or gone away, hopefully sooner rather than later. But the pro sports leagues, the NFL clearly started it with the quarantine. Uh, My daughter's boyfriend is a lineman with the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, Carson Wentz got COVID last Monday and they're like, Oh my God, we don't have Carson Wentz for the game. He ended up, they changed the rule to five days, right? The NFL. So people could come back and be readily available because he didn't have any, he was asymptomatic. That's I think where the problem lies guys is that, you know, and again, I said this last year, it was either on a social media. I probably played with the quote unquote flu maybe six times in my 12 years, call it. Once every two years, I'd play with a terrible stomach bug where I couldn't even walk in. Uh, as Keith Yandel will probably tell you, you have to play through games like that in your NHL career, and that's the way it always was. Now, if you're testing for guys coming, feeling bubbly in the morning with a smile on their face, ready to go that night, they test positive, they're out of the game. So from that standpoint, the, the initial protocols in terms of what the leagues were doing to me, yes, is a joke. 
The quarantine was too long. The biggest thing they have to do now, and this is a sports league, the fans are protected, right? Like there's nobody behind the bench. Just if it's just player against player and that they're supposed to be healthy in the game, asymptomatic players want to play and they don't feel anything wrong. So I think that's where the problem is coming from, where general managers like Steve Eisenman, uh, high, you know, uh, big name players like Carter Harder start and actually say, guys, like, I feel fine. We can't have to stop testing people that are asymptomatic for no reason. If you come in with symptoms in the morning or after a game or something's not right, then I think the decision is right. If you have COVID to shut you down, put you out of the play for the amount of quarantine days it's suggested, and then go from there. But testing guys that have nothing wrong with them, I think is ridiculous, guys, especially when there are real cases that are out there. And now you're kind of mixing the two of them together. I don't know what's real anymore and what isn't, but the NHL, like the NFL, clearly has got to figure this or figure this out really quick because it's hurting the integrity of the game now with the amount of like if you're, you can't cancel the game last. I know what you're saying, Anthony, because it's on the West Coast. What if that was the first game of the Western uh, swing? Right. Like you're dealing now with hundreds of thousands of dollars in travel to go back and forth. Those charter flights, they don't give those away. So there's a lot of economic reasons, which is I'm trying to say to you guys and, and everyone know, and, and people listening, sports leagues are a financial model and they're going to try to get through this how they can. Uh, that's why I think at the end of the day, they're saying we got we got to figure out a way to put our best players on the ice nightly. And if they don't have symptoms, how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the new year, and I think we talked about this, but like at the end of the new year, the NBA released new um, new guidelines. They changed the quarantine period for asymptomatic people or, well, anybody to, who tested positive from uh, 10 down to six. And then we saw the CDC even say five days is the quarantine period. And then five days after that are masked. Fine. The issue that you're going to run into here, and it's it's something that you you just said, Bundy, is like there are people who are inherently going to be more worried about this than others. And that's, that's your prerogative. Like if you're listening yeah. to this right now and you think that like Bundy's an insane person who like needs to be institutionalized because <laughs> he said that like, you know, we shouldn't be shutting down sports in the world. Like you're entitled to that. I think you're probably a little bit cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but like live your best life. <laughs> but like the, the fact is whether people want to admit it or not. And I've said this, I've said this publicly and I've said this privately so I, I will stand by this. The biggest issue that we have right now in this country with COVID is that there are a lot of people who have gotten themselves very worked up for two years about the worst case scenario that could play out. And so they have made a ton of decisions based on that to keep themselves or their family safe or their friends safe or whoever safe. And as vaccinations have rolled out, there was like a, an initial, maybe like, let's say uh, a poor job of expressing what vaccines actually do. And that like, they're not necessarily going to prevent you from getting it, but it's going to lower your symptoms. It's going to reduce and it's going to make it more mild. And like that was lost and was a very poor job. And it's created a lot of division in our country. But what we see here with sports is you're talking about elite level athletes who can make a decision on their own, whether or not they want to put themselves in position where they might be in a locker room with other players who are COVID positive, potentially that are asymptomatic. And they can make that decision to play. They can make that decision to stay with their families or they can choose not to, right? Like players could appeal to their organizations and say, I have immunocompromised people in my household. I have little yeah. kids and I'm, I'm very worried about it. And I'm sorry, but like, I can't in my heart of hearts play. And if that's the understanding that we work under, which is accurate, then as a fan, I don't think it's necessarily fair then to say, because I, as a human being, am worried about COVID, that should like lead a league to make decisions that are based on my beliefs. The league obviously cares about money. They care about revenue. These players care about money and they care about revenue. Ultimately, they want to play the game. They want to get paid because they are making a livelihood for themselves and for their families. So all of this is to say, if the NHL is going to continue down this path, they're going to continue to meet resistance. And Iserman might have been the first and Carter Hart might have been like the first player on the Flyers who said anything publicly, but it will continue like these. Uh, we won't call them outbursts because they're really not. But these moments of like publicly challenging the league's stance on these things, it, it's going to continue. It almost has to, because at some point there has to be a rational sane way to look at this. We talked Russ. about this before, but like a player can go into a bar with unmasked people, right? But we talked about this earlier in the year. We're not allowed in the locker room, even though we had to provide that we were vaccinated. 
even though we have to wear masks, even though we're taking all these precautions, we can't do that because of the possible exposure to the players. But that player can go right down the, the road to Chickies and Pete's into a bar with like 30 or 40 unmasked people at like 1030 at night. And there's nothing they can do about it. They can go into Wegmans or they can go into Acme or to Giant unmasked and live their lives and go shopping and they can contract the virus. But if they're asymptomatic, like I'm not sure what we're doing here. If the players are signing off that they're comfortable with this and the organization sign off that they're comfortable with it and the people who are working in the arenas have opted to keep these jobs or to work in these positions, then like as a fan, there shouldn't be public outcry to shut down the league. It just doesn't make sense. No, I, and you, you're saying everything you're saying is 100% correct. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's really is, Ross, because – you know, we're just trying to ask people to be logical here and not just people. We're asking the league to be logical and just say, you know what? Yes. If you have a symptomatic player, take them out of the, like Bundy said, take them out for the quarantine hey, time, five quarantine. days, six days. Yeah. Five, yeah. Five days. If they're symptomatic and they test positive, fine. Or if you have a player who's got an underlying condition that we maybe we don't know about, okay, that player needs to be tested regularly. And if they test positive, even if they're asymptomatic, they probably should come out because of that situation. Or if they have someone living at home or that, they, that they're around a loved one that is immunocompromised, right? And, and they want to say, you know what? I feel more comfortable being tested regularly just so I know for my own benefit, for my own, my family's sake. That's fine. You could continue to do those things. But if you have people who are young guys like a Carter Hart, who's living alone in an apartment, doesn't have a, a wife and kids, who is asymptomatic, why is he even being tested? That's where, that's where we're, the, the, the leagues have lost their way. And they've crossed, they, they're just not, not even paying attention. And it's a shame because the NHL, at the onset of this pandemic in 2020, handled it better than any sports league. Their bubbles were great. The way that they handled the bubbles, they had no problems. They weren't getting any infections while they were up there. Really, really handled it better than anybody else. And now I think that because, and maybe it might be because you're dealing with two different countries here. We have a border issue with, with Canada, you know, wanting to do things one way and the U.S. doing things a different way. I, I think that that could be the biggest problem. And so therefore maybe the NHL is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And, and, you know, we're criticizing them, but maybe they really can't do anything because of that. And if that's the case, fine. I mean, it sucks, but fine. But at the same time, if you can find a way to just kind of massage that a little bit enough so that you could, you could field a real professional team for a game and not have to do what, like we were watching a game last night. It's like, who the hell are half of these guys yeah. that are playing? You know, I mean, I know that I follow the league, you follow the league, Bunny. Like I'm watching this Ducks team and I'm like, I've never heard of half of yeah. these players. I didn't know who 14 guys were. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the problem. Yeah, I didn't know who they were. Sports, I mean, sports are entertainment, right? Sports are a form of entertainment. So yeah. we're out here, we're out here testing players who, again, have opted to make this their job. And my question would be, if Taylor Swift comes into Wells Fargo Center for a concert, is, is T-Swift getting a swab up the nose? Are her backup singers? Are other people performing on stage? Is the band? Are any of the freelance people or the union workers who are working at the concert getting tested? Because if not, then it's a double standard. Then it's like, what are we doing? You know what I mean? That to yeah. me is, I think, part of the problem. Like, as a... As a league, the NHL has gone so far to try to appease a vocal group of people who, for better or worse, are being left behind. The general sentiment surrounding COVID has begun to change because we're two years in. The most recent variant, for the most part, because whether it's vaccines or it's boosters or whatever, has not been some incredibly horribly like 33% of people that contract die super insane thing. And hopefully we'll never get a variant like it. But like the vast majority of people that are listening to this show or are watching on YouTube probably know many people who have gotten COVID at this point. And yes, it is horrible because in the initial stages where there was not a lot known, there was obviously no way to do enough research. A lot of people died and it was tragic. And there are still people dying and it's still tragic. But at some point, the question just has to be asked, like, at what point do we say we're OK as a society to enjoy this entertainment with the people who have signed up for these jobs? And the same way that somebody would say, um, 
you know, if you don't want to get vaccinated, you don't have to have that job, go get another job. I think we can also say if you're looking at this and as a fan, you're upset because this league is performing because these people opted to have these jobs. You don't have to watch it. You don't have to support it. You can blackball like you can blacklist the NHL and say that you don't like how they're going about this. But the fact is that, like, all of these leagues are going to start trending in a less conservative manner. The NHL seems to be the last one to do it. The NFL's done it. The NBA's done it. And when the CDC comes out and cuts the, the quarantine period in half, like we're, we're trending in a different direction. And so even the people who have been the most worked up or the most upset about this are going to have to accept the fact that at some point, the rest of society is going to move on. And you can absolutely make whatever decision you think is best for you. But you can't then fault an entire league of people that have actively chosen these jobs. It just doesn't work. Unless we're going to shut everything down again, but that's, I, that's, I don't. That's what I was going to say, Russ. Right? Like, what? So, if the NHL, if they're really that concerned, go back to the bubble with no fans. They yeah. won't, right? But if you're that concerned, won't. go back to a bubble, pay the players their full salary with no fans in the building, and give us a call back and let us know how that's working out for your business model. They did. That. And Bundy, that's why, why wouldn't they? And why wouldn't they do this, it? guys? It's all it there does. There you go. And here's the Thanks, other thing. That's it. We, I raised this concern when Philadelphia put into place the vaccine requirement for people attending games. And I said, attendance hasn't been great anyway. Is this going to hurt it even more? And I also opened the possibility that there were a lot of people who might not have been comfortable going into an arena where you knew there were like potentially unvaccinated people. You might have like another contingent of people that now will feel comfortable because everybody's vaccinated. And from my vantage point, I'm like, all right, whether it's 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 or in a better market, you know, you're, you're going to sellouts. There are still tens of thousands of people or thousands of people who are going to games that feel comfortable enough with their decisions to go to games. You can't then just shut a league down when you have fan bases that want to attend these games, players that need to get paid, organizations that for better or worse, like they need to generate revenue or the teams fold. At some point, like you have to move the conversation forward. You have to move this whole thing forward. I just don't know when it's going to happen for the NHL. And I don't know if it's going to be like too little too late because what we're seeing right now is a massively diluted product. You guys have talked about before, the the number of top elite talent players that you have in a league don't end up on the same team often because there are so many teams to spread this talent out to. Where you're looking at like fourth lines, or you're looking at third pair, you know, third defensive pairs, where you're like, these guys, you know, typically wouldn't be NHL caliber, but just by by virtue of how many teams there are, you have a lot of players that maybe in past years or past decades wouldn't have been NHL players. Well, now you have taxi squads that are comprised of guys who are tweeners at best who are now being thrust in. And like, I'm sorry, but that doesn't cut it. If you're a consumer and you're going out and you're paying premium for your ticket, you deserve to see the best possible product on the ice. The same way that in the NBA, people railed against the Spurs for sitting like the Tim Duncans, the Manu Ginobili's, the Tony Parkers. You can't put like there, there is a, an inherent double standard that exists here because Basketball has so few people and hockey has so many, or the NFL has so many. At some point, you've got to find consistency and the NHL is going to have to do something. Otherwise, total disaster, absolute disaster. Anthony, I know you got to go. Bundy and I will continue on, but. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, something came up from work while we're recording this and I actually have to step away here. But um, so I, I look forward. I, I agree 100 percent with everything you guys are talking about. COVID, keep it up. It's awesome stuff. Um, when you get into talking about the team before you criticize me for sitting there saying everything's wonderful, go, go ahead and read what I wrote. Uh, the last couple of game stories. And you'll, you'll start to see, uh, I'm starting to come more towards your side that, that things really kind of suck with this team right now. But just kind of throwing that out there so you guys can discuss and uh, I'll, I'll chat with you later. It's a, it's a New Year's resolution. There it is. Honesty. A, a more realistic Ant San Philly. Don't forget to follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Ant San Philly. You can find that, of course, in the description of this episode. One click away from following the man. Yeah. So see him. See Ant. Bundy, I'm pretty sure now I've done the show for years with Anthony. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the closest I've ever gotten to a, a, a mea culpa on his part. I don't think he's ever actually admitted being wrong before or trending yeah, into being yeah. wrong. But, but here we are. Very interesting. I said, uh, it, that was pretty good by him. I was actually good. And then he got off the air really quick, so he couldn't explain it. So it was actually pretty good, Russ. I liked it. Uh, yep. You're right, though. You know, Just getting back on the COVID thing. And, and again, like we're not – I don't think we're speaking in, in crazy term here at all. I just think that we – you know, again, I think the world is looking for – the world is looking to move on. 
as efficiently and safely as possible. Uh, but I just don't think the NHL's plan and how they're doing that now, having players that have no symptoms are not playing games is ridiculous. So uh, it will get rectified because this is a big business. And every time, you know, and, and again, <clears throat> it's not just the fact that the COVID's out there that people aren't going to maybe will be apprehensive to go to games. The more talk about it there is also gets in people's ears and that deters them also. So, yeah. you know, I think it's one of those cases where if you know and you feel like it's best you can go to a game safely, go ahead. But the players at, at terms, and I agree with what you said there, Russ, you know, like we didn't, they didn't sign up for that. This is what their profession was, right? Like they're, they're yeah. hockey players, uh, just like the business owners of teams are, are trying to run a business too. And sports are a big part of our lives, everybody, you know, in this country. Yeah. So, you know, again, we don't, we don't want to take it for granted. We want people to be safe. That's I, I know that I know I do. I know everyone involved does even Carter Hart, Steve Eisman, nobody wants to see anybody unsafe, but I think that they have to get a handle of this in a, in a way that's more sufficient for the players involved. There's also a mental health aspect to this whole thing. And then we'll move on. We'll talk about the team, but like, I, I have to tell people because I don't think enough people are, are cognizant of what's happening in schools, right? I was a teacher. I left teaching. There were a lot of reasons that I left teaching, but one of them was it was an absolutely devastating thing to go into work every day and to see uh, so many kids battling depression. And like in the, in, in like, my early years of teaching, you would hear a kid say that they're depressed and you go, all right, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. And there are certain services that you would refer a kid to uh, in hopes of, of giving them help if they need it or like kind of, you know, figuring out if they're not right. But the number of kids that I saw being just burned out over the last couple of years was disheartening and was devastating. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. You know, there's always this like narrative about Gen Zers, um, you know, being wimpy or, you know, back in my day, we would just rub dirt on it, like that kind of nonsense. And it's like, no, what, what you're experiencing or what people are experiencing in schools is like teachers can't effectively do their jobs. Students at this point feel defeated and, and disheartened because uh, when, when you spend a year and a half telling kids that they can't sit together at lunch and like, I will tell you the school that I worked in, which I loved, I loved the people I worked with. I loved my students. But like when you have a cafeteria lined up with desks where it looks like kids are in just a giant study hall and nobody's allowed to really interact because there's so much distance. You know, there, there were uh, psychologists that said we shouldn't use the term social distancing because the idea of social and distancing kind of like creates this barrier. It creates this idea of like not actually being able to socialize with one another. There's that kind of disconnect, whereas it's like just physical distancing, right? But what it did was it created a, a mental health crisis in our youth. And now research is starting to come out. These are things that like teachers had been saying and administrators have been saying, and parents had been saying for the better part of the, the first year of the pandemic, and it's continued on. And so all of this is to say that there are a lot of people right now who are struggling, and it's not just kids, it's not just teachers, it's not just students, it's not just administrators, it's not just the parents, but sports happens to be one of those forms of entertainment that gives people an escape. And whether it's going yes. into the building to support or it's turning on the TV and rooting on their favorite team. There is a conscious effort uh, being made by a consumer to tune in and watch a sport for whatever reason. And if it's for their entertainment, or if it's for a kid who uh, comes from a, a household that's not the best, but that's the way that they bond with a parent or they bond with a sibling is turning on the game at night and watching the Flyers, taking that away from them because somebody is worried about one of the players giving COVID to another player, to me is just an unfair thing. Like at some point we just have to look at this thing from a more macro, more macro viewpoint and say, what's best for everyone or what's best for the vast majority of people. People will continue to make their own decisions, but this is one outlet that people can have. And that while the world still is in different stages of kind of returning to normal or to, to making some changes or to maybe making some strides, taking away sports could have a massively adverse effect, especially, and I will focus this back in, especially on younger people who right now don't feel a lot of hope and don't go to that safe place of a school feeling the camaraderie with their classmates or able to participate in sports or clubs in the same way or to interact with their teachers in the same way. I'm just kind of like, give, give the kids, if nothing else, give the kids sports. Let them have their favorite teams to watch. Let those families come together and spend that time together and have at least a slice of normalcy so that whether or not it's going to the grocery store or going to wherever the hell they're going to go to a restaurant, whatever, 
things aren't normal. They might be kind of returning to normal. Depends on where you're listening to this from. But like give the kids something, some slice of normalcy. And for, for many of them, it's sports. That's it. And, 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 and you're right, Russ. And, you know, I don't, I, I could sit here for an hour talking about, you know, I mean, also in a, uh, you know, in the, in the space with, uh, you know, recovering alcohol and, and drug addicts and stuff. And, and that's something I've done the entire 2021. Um, and I can't even, I could sit here for an hour telling you the amount of uh, overdoses, how they've gone up, the amount of drugs that have come into this country that have killed people. Um, alcohol, uh, sales are up over 225% in almost two years. I mean, these are real solid, hard numbers and, and they've all factored in. Again, uh, these are just things people are going to have to eventually down the road, get back to normalcy and learn to live with it. But sports is a great outlet, you know, and I, and I think as long as the players uh, feel that they're not going to hurt anybody doing it, then they need to, they need to figure out a way to make that happen. But Again, I think just the end of it, Russ, asymptomatic, they need to stop testing asymptomatic people in, in, in the NHL. Somebody comes in with one sniffle, worthy of a test. But if you come in and you say, I'm feeling great, I mean, my head feels awesome, there's nothing wrong with me, you got to let that guy, you, you got to avoid the testing for that player. And that's the only way to do it. I know some people won't like that, but that's the way it is. And if you don't want to go see a sporting event, don't go. You have a right to go. The problem is, I think, is that there's so much confusion built into society right now. Like you said, you know, I can go walk into a Target or a Walmart as I do many times during the week. I don't know. You don't have to wear a mask. Some people do. Some people don't. I go to Eagles games every week. There's 70,000 people there. You know, I, I enjoy that time with my kids. And I'm not going to let something out there, unless it's going to absolutely take me out, uh, affect the way that I'm, I'm going to go about my business. I want to make sure I'm safe for everybody, which I am. I've been vaccinated. And I think we all have. That's your. That's what you're doing for, for other people is, is being told what to do. And we followed the orders. The problem is, though, is that there's so many discrepancies in terms of walks of life uh, that it's hard for anybody to really say, okay, here's, you know, one size fits all. There's no one size fits all anywhere. Uh, the other problem we're, uh, that we, you guys talked about a little bit, the, the Canadian games, the Canadian government is a real problem for sports teams going up there. Like they are very, very strict with their rules. They're on a shutdown in Ontario right now. You know, Ontario is the biggest state or a province, excuse me, in the country. And, uh, you know, with Toronto being the fourth, you know, one of the five, top five biggest metros in all of North America, uh, there's no more indoor dining. They shut everything down like it was the infancy of the pandemic again. Those are tough things to deal with when you probably have a handful of people making those decisions. There's no league in the world that's going to be able to go up and above on a federal government mandate like that. So uh, that's a major, major problem up north in Canada. I mean, it's very, very strict. Uh, yeah. Where I know a lot of Canadians myself, they, they think it's ridiculous to be quite honest with you. So, and well, yeah. And I mean, it's not worth it. It's not, it's not worth going further down that, but you are correct. Like it's going to cause problems. Now let me throw this to you really quick. So uh, let's say conceptually Canada goes you know, further into a, a lockdown and like, let's say that all of the Canadian teams or, or most of the Canadian teams have to shut down. Right. And the NHL is presented with a, a real no-win situation. My assumption is that Canada shutting down, the, the teams would have to reschedule games and that maybe they would use the Olympic break or what was going to be the Olympic break to make up those games. The league's plan, at least initially, was to take all of the games that have had to be postponed or rescheduled and then move them into that Olympic break over those, those few weeks. Mm -hmm. conceptually is it possible that they would look to do something like that I, I guess they could maybe it would make sense I'm I'm just spitballing like does it make sense you can't split Canada off into a Canadian division again like I don't know how you would do it I don't know if you could realign right so if that's even the do case, it do you look at having the Canadian teams play their remaining games against other Canadian teams over that time and then since you have the buildings booked for other games, do you switch opponents? So like if there's a game where the Flyers are supposed to play the Maple Leafs, do you then have the Maple Leafs play the Senators in, in place of the Flyers game? And then later in the year, when the Maple Leafs were scheduled to play the Senators, they would just play the Flyers instead. Like if the arenas are already reserved, it really doesn't matter which team is coming in, right? And it doesn't matter where you're heading. Like maybe that makes sense. I don't know. I genuinely I, you don't know, know how I mean, you fix this. I don't know how you make it better. If you shut down... The league's in trouble. Well, they shut down like they've shut down like junior leagues in Canada now. Like that. Yeah. I, I know parents, the guys my age that have kids in the leagues. And they're like, I don't, we don't even know what to do. Like they're coming up on draft years and stuff. They're missing, you know, I, again, so there's always that concern too with your kids and stuff and all of it. But I, you know what's going to happen? I mean, if, if Canada keeps doing that the, in the NHL staggers, let's say they fall three weeks behind home games, right? 
Yeah. They're going to almost have to go play those games on the road as the home team. I mean, what's the difference? You get the home, you get the face off. That's it. And, yeah. but to tell you what, uh, there's probably a way to do that, Russ, where if like, let's say Montreal or Flyers was to play at Montreal that night, uh, if Montreal cannot, or, or Toronto, let's say, cannot play in, in Ontario for an extended period of time, they may as well take their home games in Toronto, come into Philadelphia, and then do a revenue share with the Flyers, you yeah. know, on the game if they can get people in. That's well, the that's only way they, I can think. That's what MLB did, right, with the Blue Jays. And didn't the NFL, no, uh, it was the, the, Blue Jays the NBA Florida, with the Raptors. Right? The-, the Raptors. The Raptors were playing down in Florida. They were playing their home games in Florida, I believe. It was at the end of last season or something like that. Like it has been done. So, but you, like, I mean, and, and the other thing you do is you could, you could use other arenas like in the North. Like, I mean, if you're in, if you're in, um, uh, in Toronto, I'm just saying Toronto. I mean, you could go to Buffalo. You could yeah. go, I mean, you could play games on the other side of Lake Ontario. If you're the Leafs yeah. or Montreal come across, but I got, first of all, Russ, I hope this doesn't happen. Like seriously, if we're dealing with this again in another month, it's probably been way too long. I know that this strand has apparently from what we're hearing was moved through South Africa pretty quick. Yeah. And I think that they're hoping by, and they think they think the last couple of days is the peak, but I can't imagine they're going to keep it shut down more than two or three weeks at this yeah. stage of the game. Right. Mm-hmm. Being knowing that, you know, we have a little bit more information on where everything's at, but you know, Canada doesn't mess around. Like they think it's bad. They shut everything down. The only other thing that they could conceivably do, I guess, would be then to go by points percentage, right? They could, they could just determine that we're going to, we're going to do playoff seating based on point percentage, but boy, that's an unfair thing too. Right. Because like if, if the Maple Leafs or something have a ridiculously high, well, I don't know, pick, pick a team. Some team goes on a run here that hasn't played as many games and all of a sudden their points percentage is ridiculous because they just got on a hot streak versus like say the flyers who have to play every game, you know, they pick a bunch of uh, losses up and all of a sudden they find themselves on the outside, even if they were a bubble team. And like, that's the difference between making the playoffs and not, I don't know if that's a fair way to go about it either. So we'll, we'll see. Let's talk about somebody who could be affected by COVID, Keith Yandel, not because he's in protocol and not because uh, we think he's going to end up in protocol, but because Keith Yandel is pursuing the Ironman streak and he can, he can reach that, what, two weeks from Monday, I believe, is when he'll, he would theoretically be able to break the Ironman streak in the NHL. That's a lot of games played. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that not all of them have been good, especially this year. Uh, not the best performance out of Keith Yandel, although he did come in on a, a dirt cheap contract. Uh, Bundy, let me ask you this. If Keith Yandel were not pursuing the record, would he be in the lineup right now? Of course not. I mean, I've seen guys play way worse than that. That's out. I'm not taking a shot at Keith Yandel. I admire the guy. I and mean, that's a lot of damn games in the league. But listen, I got, I got benched just because I walked in and someone looked at me wrong one night. I mean, that's the way it went back then. And I played almost, I never missed a playoff game, but you know what? I, I you know, um, yeah, yeah. If, if that's a simple answer, of course he would. I wouldn't be surprised if he breaks the record and he's out the next night, if they have enough healthy players, seriously, that's just the way that's it kind is. of where and, I'm at too. Yeah. I mean, he's an older aging guy. That's never been a defensive warrior. I mean, no one's ever misconstrued the fact that he's, you know, lit up the D zone with great, you know, plays. He's been a power play guy. He's a good skater. Um, he's minus 17 this year. I mean, on a, you know, in 33 games with no goals and 11 assists, you know, point every three games would be respectable at the end of the day, but you know, most of them are power play points and uh, I, with about almost 16 minutes of ice time. So yeah, yeah. He's, he'd be out of the lineup for sure. No question about it. He's eight games, 15 days away. He has to avoid COVID for yeah. two weeks. Now, the reason I bring it up is because, all right, the, the Flyers have probably hurt themselves this year by having him in the lineup because he's pursuing this, this streak. And, and for better or worse, I will say, like whether it's a hockey ops side or it's the, uh, the financial side of things that we're kind of making a, a move for this, the idea of having Gandal in a Flyers sweater breaking the record on home ice is a pretty, in, a pretty enticing thing because – Unless some other player eventually breaks this record, the Ironman streak will forever go down as being Keith Yandel in a flyer sweater. It is, it will be an iconic moment. Assuming he reaches it, it'll be an iconic moment in NHL history. It'll be in the record books that he did it as a flyer. My issue is if he contracts COVID and hell asymptomatic and contracts COVID and the league continues this protocol, we could theoretically see Keith Yandel 
on the morning of January 20th, when the Flyers are about to play the Blue Jackets, get pulled and not be able to pursue the record because he's asymptomatic with COVID. Now, that would be one hell of a horrible way to end that, wouldn't it? It would It'd be terrible for him because I know that he's, you know, I remember those games when I was even covering it before and I think he had an injury one day or he's really sick, something happened. And I remember he came out in the game and played, but it's probably seven or eight years ago. And I remember it was like, wow, he's, he's finally going to miss a game. I think he played at like 400 at the time or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, that would be, that would be one of those cases where that would be devastating for him, um, you know, to have had an asymptomatic problem and they tested him for it. If I were him, I would just, I would just tell the trainer, stay away from me for two weeks. <laughs> I mean, I know one thing. There's no, I, I, and again, I haven't, I, I don't know. I haven't heard any about Doug Jarvis, um, but he would be, and he's probably got his fingers crossed right now. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a decorated record, right? To play that many games. And he's had it yeah. for how many years? Since probably the early 80s, late seventies, early eighties. So I know he's probably got his fingers crossed, but I, I'm hoping for. So people. you're saying I he's like he's, the, he's like the 72 dolphins. Anytime a team would go undefeated and, you know, they had the chance yes. to uh, they, they like, like when the Patriots party. were about to break it and then they have like a little party. Does Jarvis then have his, his yeah. own little, yeah. does yeah, he have a party? Does, does Jarvis, yeah. does Jarvis try to like get into the trainer's room and taint the sample? That's the really, that's the real question that people are asking. Nobody's asking that. Might be too old for that now, but I mean, you know, Doug, that's a lot of games. It's funny. I, I actually, uh, it's <laughs> so now it tell us I'm going to show my age. Cause I caught it at the end. I played with guys that played against Doug Jarvis. Mm-hmm. And they said the last like month and a half that he was trying to like get that record. They tried to run the shit out of this guy every night. <laughs> Players in the league. Like they were trying to get to a point where he didn't get the record. And I heard more than one guy tell me that in my career, more than one guy that played in that era that caught me at the end. And I thought it was like, wow. I mean, that's, that's the difference in the league now, right? Like you had guys trying to like make sure it didn't happen. Now you have everybody celebrating. It's just two different, two different worlds out there. Is Funny though. the idea of an Iron Man streak, I don't, I don't want to make this new school versus old school, but like, is it indicative of, he, he's a defenseman, right? You think of defensemen, you've played defense in the NHL. I think about block shots. I think about giving up the body. I think about being imposing. Yandel's not exactly that guy. Is it as impressive for him to achieve this in this era as it was for Jarvis or does it kind of speak to, I don't know, maybe like an elite ability to maintain his his body through a grueling schedule with plenty of travel? And like it speaks more to the ability to to stay healthy that way more so than like, I don't know, he's he like I said, he's not giving up the body quite like other defensemen in the league. Well, you know, I mean, and you look at Doug Jarvis's career. I mean, he was a defensive player, you know, defensive uh, a forward. Um I can assure you right now, the game in Keith Yandel's time was not as physical as that, as it was then. So it's less, you know, wear and tear, I think, on the body. I mean, I, I played in an era where the guys got run over every night, and I, I broadcasted in an era where you could fall asleep some nights uh, because there was no physicality at all. And I've said that before. But, um, you know, again, I, that's a good question. You know, the, also the speed has gone up a little bit in, in this game, but I, I just think the wear and tear that a body takes with being battered nightly – uh, and going through, um, you know, those playoff rigors. I don't know how many games Keith Yandel has in the playoffs. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head right now, but you know what? I, again, like those play, when you play big, like rich playoff series, they can take a lot out of you for some time, you know, the more battles you get into. So those are other things too. I don't, um, I just, um, you know, remember going back into my own days, like you get in the playoff series sometimes, you come out of there and you didn't even have time to rest for the next one. Uh, they take a lot out of you. So, Answer your uh, question. He has played in 58 career playoff games, um, including three last season. Okay. 58. Yeah, yeah that's, that's not, not a, a lot. That's t- it's not a ton of extra wear and tear on the body. No, it's, it's not. I mean, it's, you know, and I think he got to the finals one year with the Rangers, maybe. Uh, was in? Yes. I'm right. That was 14, that 15. Really he had, yeah, 2014, 15. He played 19 games, had 11 points. Yeah, I think that was that year. That was yeah, that yeah, was Vino as the coach. Yep. Yeah, that's not a lot of wear and tear when you take a you know a team like in terms of a lot of games. Um, I just don't think the style is quite the same. So, but again, you know what? I appreciate the effort he's put in. That's a that's that's lacing up your skates every single night. 
for a yeah. long time. And, and for that, yeah. I, I salute him. But, I mean, you asked me the question, would he be out of the lineup? I mean, he knows he'd be out of the lineup unless he was just flat out in, in denial about where he's at in his career. But, I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, that's that's the harsh reality. Uh, just for the hockey historians out there, the 2014-15 New York Rangers that were uh, – coached by Elaine Vigneault, lost in the conference finals in seven games that year to the Tampa Bay Lightning. So there you go. There's your little Rangers fact of the Snow the Goalie podcast. Um, all right, so we know what's going on with the Andal. The Flyers, if, if we take a look just right now at, at where they stand, things aren't as hunky-dory as Anthony might have wanted them to be at some point. They trail Boston by four points for the final wild card spot. Uh, the Flyers are only a point ahead of Columbus, You've got Jersey in the mix, uh, also with 31 points. The Islanders, who've had a, an abysmal season, but you have to think at some point are going to turn things around it at least a bit, uh, are six points behind the Flyers. Um, where are we going here, Bundy? Like, it's a lot of mediocrity. There's a lot of teams that are still in some form of contention for a playoff spot. Um if the season were to end today, the teams making it in the Eastern Conference would be Tampa, Boston, Florida, uh, Toronto, the Rangers, the Penguins, the Capitals, and the Hurricanes. If and, if and you, had, you had Boston, yeah, I, I did have Boston. If if I held you over a railing and said you have to answer this honestly in in the uh, the earnestness of your heart. Do the Flyers have a realistic chance of competing in a series with Tampa? No. Do they no, have a realistic don't. chance of competing in a series with Florida? No. Neither of those real... two teams are a good match, but they're, they're not a good matchup for a lot of teams either. Yeah. Uh, you said no, Tampa, let... Tampa won two cups. They have the number, I think they had the number one points in the league after Christmas. So, no, I, my answer is no. You got a Flyers team now with 33 games, they have 32 points. Mm-hmm. That's a dumpster fire. That's an NHL dumpster fire. Yeah, they're four points out of the playoffs. But if you look at Boston, uh, Boston's got four games, as Anthony said, four games in hand on them. There could be yeah. separation like they've never seen. No, they can't beat Florida. Or, or, could, the or Flyers, could the Flyers contend with the Rangers? I, I, in its seven games, I guess anything could happen. The Rangers are more realistic for me than those other two. I mean, anything, How about you know, Washington? Washington's kind of with the Rangers. Like they, they're a little thin if they got if they had some more bodies back. Like right now, they're kind of a one trick pony up front with some of the injuries and stuff they've had early in the year. But no, I mean that's a tough matchup too. You know, it's a tough, tough matchup. All four of those teams are not would not be a good matchup for the Flyers. Yep. Would and every uh, and, 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 and all I'm, I'm just trying to look at it from like a, a first round perspective because they would not play the Bruins unless the Bruins go on a tear. Although I would say the Bruins are not a good matchup for the Flyers. The Maple Leafs. Yeah. Uh, you know, if there's, if there's, if there's, if there's, if there's a multi-week shutdown and the Maple Leafs don't have momentum going into the postseason, like uh, maybe the Penguins competitive series, maybe the hurricanes, you would think the hurricanes Toronto. would go ahead. The hurricanes would be a real, real problem for the Flyers too. The prior, yeah. anytime you take a team with really, really high end skill, players at the front like Aho, Teravainen for for uh, uh, and and the uh, the young Russian kid there it's just like uh, sorry I got a brain cramp uh, he's unbelievable for Carolina too he's when he's, he's healthy but they got um they're 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 a top heavy team you know the Flyers really struggle when they have a nasty group of forwards on their team with high skill levels uh yeah Pittsburgh yeah I think they could be Svechnikov yeah I'm sorry yeah I uh, just uh more, morning brain cramp uh, okay. But yeah, I mean, he's a great player, but they, they really, I mean, that's a, that's a highly elite skill level player. Um, and then, you know, the other teams, Pittsburgh, yes, I, I think they can make a series of that Toronto. I do. I mean, Matthews would be a problem for him and a couple of the other skilled players, but I think the flyers would, th- those, they would be more realistic than those other teams that you mentioned that t- tend to play in the offensive zone, hang on to the puck a lot and really wear you out. So all of this is to say, that unless some really janky things happen with the standings, the the majority of the teams the Flyers could theoretically play would be a bad matchup. So we come back to the notion of what should this team really be doing? Do you think that by the time the trade deadline comes around, we'll have clarity on this team? Or do you think this this the way that this team has played, the way that they went on a point streak after losing 10 straight, are we looking at a team that is just going to be maddening 
on their way to the very last game of the season? Or do you think that we will get clarity? Like, is there a scenario? I brought this up before, but I think it's now more plausible because Ryan Ellis apparently has not made any progress. Mike Yo said no progress made. And I brought this up on the last show, I believe, about why not just LTIR Ellis at this point? Shut him down. He's He's been nothing for you, right? Like he's played, what, four games, five games? If Ellis has been nothing and you're still a quasi playoff bubble team, even though I don't think it's in the best interest of the team to make the playoffs, if you're in contention for it and you LTIR and now you freed up some cap space, could the Flyers be a buyer at the trade deadline in pursuit of a final playoff spot? Does it make sense? Or do you think oh, they're no. just going to bottom out and it's going to be bad? Well, I mean, that's a decision for Chuck to make and the people around him, but I, I don't want to see that. I mean, there a lot, put it this way. Uh, and, which don't, um, which don't you want to see? Yes, a lot of good is going to have to happen for that to happen. For them if to we're going the out and they're going to make a trade that's going to try to slip you into the playoffs, forget about it. I laid out already basically my feelings about this team a couple months ago and what I thought they were. I still think they need to go to Giroux and say, where can you go? Where can we send you? That will work for you uh, to give you a chance to win in the playoffs. If you want to go and win, um, that's that would be my priority if I were the GM. I would softly, clearly he wants to stay here. I would softly say we need to do this for the betterment of our team because just signing you to an extension doesn't help us at all. You have to trade Giroux, and then if he wants to come back, then you figure something out. But you need to get pieces for him, whether it's a couple picks, a player involved, um, I don't know if it'll be as juicy as you think it, you want it to be because he's, you know, he doesn't have a, a year left. Um, yeah. But that would be my priority. And then you're going to have to do a full reevaluation of, of the guys that you think are your quote unquote young talent that are going to carry you forward. They haven't yet. The young defensemen have not yet. The, the, the core group of young forwards have not yet. And you're running out of yet time, you know, like that, that comes to an end where you have to hit the reset button. But, I mean, we've had guys that were told five years ago, when you, when you hear it on the broadcast some nights, you think that you're dealing with Bobby Orr uh, yeah. or Mario Lemieux up front, the way that, you know, the broadcasters sell it to us. That's that's wrong. That's not the way I'm watching the game. Uh, so, again, there's decisions that they're going to have to make uh, as an organization for the betterment of the team. And you may have to take a step backwards for a while, but if you're going to take a step backwards for a while to try to, you know, and, and you have the right guy making the decisions – I think that's the way this franchise has to go. And I'm not coming off of that 32 points in 33 games. That's what this team is right now. I hope they prove me wrong and go on a 25 game winning streak and turn everything around. But I don't think it's in the cards for them this year. The likelihood of and it if happening they do, is very, you know what, Russ, if they do win the next 25 in a row, let me tell you something. What are you going to do? That would put, that would put them at 82 points <laughs> <laughs> with just 20 left in the year. So jeez. Um, Hey, I, That's, I, I do. This kind of goes to one of the points that you made. Uh, one of our longtime listeners, BJ Beretta, tweeted at at Snow the goalie and said, uh, "Watching fifth rounder Terry turn first rounder Sandheim into a pylon. I wonder: do the one do the Flyers draft poorly? Two, develop poorly? Three, there's still time for realized potential. Besides Giroux, Couturier, and possibly Hart, what other impact fly, or what other impact players have we fully developed in the past decade?" So let's start at, at the initial thing. Do the Flyers draft poorly? I've made the case about well, Chuck I mean, Fletcher I, historically on, on his drafts prior to Philadelphia. We look at the Hextall regime. We think about the, the way that the drafts were initially perceived versus like what they've amounted to. Probably safe to say that not a ton of great drafting in the Hextall era. Do they develop poorly? I don't know. How, do you, how can you say that a team does a poor job of development if the players that are drafted aren't good players or is that, or is it more of a thought of, Hey, if you coach well enough, if you, if you do have the, the appropriate or the, the best coaches or elite coaches at developing talent, you can turn a turd into a gold nugget, right? Like, I don't know if you can, that's, that's a question for you. Is it drafting poorly, developing poorly, or should we just continue to wait? Trying to turn a turd into a Snickers bar. Are you right here on the air? Oh. There you go. Well, you know, I think uh, most people can just turn the Snickers into a turd. So, you know, well, you know, it's, it's funny, like, you know, like, I, I don't want, I, I hate making an example. I'm just thinking of someone who's been here long enough to do a comparison. Okay. Connect me and Proveroff. 
right? They'd probably be two guys that, you know, essentially I think that they, they came in. I think both of them had Konechny his first year. So I'll take Konechny. He made a lot of like little junior mistakes that, you know, he's making backhand passes and trying to be more clever. Then he started doing things I thought more the right way, like kind of like North NHL stuff. And then sometimes he goes back and reverts back. They rewarded him with a large contract uh, last, before last year, an extended, a, a lengthy extension. And um, I don't know if that necessarily has worked out. I think TK is a good player. I just think yeah. that he needs to find that niche in the league. And to me, the niche for him is to go to the front of the net, like a Brendan Gallagher type player and then just stay in that focus. He's not a, he's not a kind of guy who's going to make wizard plays in the neutral zone and, and sauce passes around. He's a go to the front of the net guy, make life difficult on whoever that defenseman is. Proveroff for me is the enigma. Um, he had an amazing first year, you know, in terms of it. he came in, he went back to junior for one year. Uh, he came in and he had a wonderful rookie year. I mean, he really, really did. He impressed me. His The workload he took on, um, the pressure, you know, pressure moments. And again, I think he's only been in the playoffs a couple times with this team. But he's the one for me that's gone totally backwards. And that, to me, would be a development issue. I mean, he's at a point now where pucks are falling off his stick. I don't think he's a first power play guy. He's not. I don't know why they keep putting him there. Uh, they need to make him just put somebody else in that position. He's not a first power play guy. I mean, in our era, he never would have played the power play probably from the guys we had. Um, his defensive zone play has gotten worse. It's almost like he's not sure who to cover. It feels like he's guessing sometimes in the D zone. That to me is, is coaching, is development and, and, and continued learning uh, on the fly. Um, that one to me is the most concerning. Because, you know, and then there's Sandheim, who's a great skater, sometimes makes mistakes. Listen, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I never made mistakes. I made lots of them. I got turned inside out like Sandheim did last night. Uh, I've missed coverages in the corner in front of the net, and that happens. But if you're going, but, but again, I, and I'll say this, you know, I was a top pair defenseman for 10 years. And whether you, you know, whether you like that type of player or not, you have to earn the right to stay up there on a winning team. And right now, this team's not winning with the same yeah. pieces that we've seen. Again, it's it's like it's like a, a merry-go-round going up and around and around and around again, and nothing changes. And I think that's what frustrates me with what I'm seeing in both player development, the way the team has come along. Uh, it's been status quo for so many things, Russ. I think it frustrates uh, both the people that have been around the team um, and the fan base. You know, I go to I I go out all the time during the day, and there's not one time I don't walk into a wah wah or a supermarket and someone comes and talks to me about Flyers hockey and, and what that looks like today compared to what it used to look like. That is the one thing I hear all the time. They're like, what happened to that franchise? I said, it's not the franchise. It's the sport. You know, in a lot of ways, the sport has, has changed, not necessarily for the better or what people want to, what were once paying money to see. They're not getting that anymore. So this might be a bad comparison. I don't think it is, but it might be. So I'm thinking of high, high draft picks that are put into roles that they probably shouldn't be in. And I feel like it, it very well could be due in part to the, the thought that you might be able to build up their confidence and then turn them into something that they might not be. So Ivan Provorov was a high pick that you've, you've invested a lot of time into. And you're putting him into this power play role that he doesn't belong in with the, the hope of maybe getting him some confidence and that, that turns him around. I look at Jalen Rager on the Eagles, a first round pick who continues to get force fed the ball every Sunday. And you know that he's not the best option, right? Like, you know, that there are guys on the team that are probably a better fit in specific roles. Like Quez Watkins on an end around makes a lot more sense in terms of an explosive player than Jalen Rager. Yet the team continues to roll him out there. And sometimes people think you put a guy in a position because you don't want to admit you made a mistake in the draft. But as a coach, the, the past draft status of a guy can't really impact your game plan. It's more of a confidence thing. It's more of a trying to unlock potential. Are we seeing something similar here with Ivan Provorov, where he's getting forced into these, these roles that he doesn't belong in, whether it's the top power play unit or whether it's as the guy who has to be the number one defenseman. They tried it last year and it failed. They tried to bring somebody in to play with him who can't stay healthy this year. Like, is that what we're looking at here? It's just the hope that if you put him in an advantageous position, something will, will click for him. And then all of a sudden he's not just a power play contributor, but he has more confidence at even strength. Is that what we're seeing? And if so, like, is that what's really best for the team? 
Yeah, yeah, and, and you know what? I, and I, I'm starting to see that a little bit. Like I thought before, he was a guy that, like, to me, he's probably they should probably try to find a way to get his minutes down somehow. I think, and that's that's you. Know, you can play. This is amazing. You can play two, three, or four minutes more a night, and it, it's a totally different game sometimes by those extra shifts. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you notice your body notice it. I, I just think that when, for some reason, he's gone backwards, and whether or not he. Whether or not he tells himself he's a number one defenseman, I think is great. I, I know he believe, has high belief in himself, but per, perception and what you're seeing in real time are two totally different things. Uh, yeah. And I think the hardest part sometimes, both for a team and the player, is accepting that. Once you're in the league five years, you are who you are. You're not going to, it's not really, you're not going to change. You're not going to become a, a star. Uh, but the good thing I've seen, and I, and I say this with a positive, is that I've seen, Travis Konechny do good things uh, offensively. And when I say that, uh, and I think now the best thing for him would be a coach say, listen, you get the puck in the zone on the power play, you go right to the front of the net. You stay there in front of the net, you get ca- crashed the loose pucks behind the net. That's what you do, and that's how you're going to score goals. I remember Craig Berube used to tell guys, um, he said, I watched Rick Tockett score 400 goals in this league going to the front of the net. That's all he did. And I think it was actually Chief that told uh, Hartnell that. He's like, you know, like going, and I remember Hartnell had like maybe 38 or 39 goals one year, but he used to use Rick Tockett as, in that adage. That's what I think connecting him. He does, there's no fighting anymore in this league anyway. Like nobody even yeah. looks at anyone. Um, so normal becomes just that, that it's not a factor. So there's no reason for anybody to be scared. Um, Provorov. I think that if, if it's one thing, it's hard for the, the, sometimes the organization, Russ, to say to themselves, geez, we didn't make a mistake. We have a good player here but we're playing him in spots that maybe he shouldn't be playing in right now, or we're he's playing two or three minutes too many a night. Let's get him off the first power play. But there are guys that feelings get hurt and they really take it personally. Like they're, they really really like there are guys that never got scratched because the coach knew if they scratched the guy sometimes for poor play that they would go totally backwards. It would, it would be a counter. So they'd be, be vigilant of that. Um, I just think that this is a guy they need to go back to see what he did before and say, here's what you need to do. Well, Here's what we think you do well, and we want you to do it every single night. But he's not a number one defenseman. I've said this for two years. He's a top four defenseman for sure, and clearly has worked well when he's had a partner that's been there for him to work well with. Um, again, they tried to get him that partner with Ryan Ellis, uh, but you, you know you get a guy in the off season that's been available to you for three or four games, whatever it is. I mean, that's not really getting your homework done. Yep. All right. I think that's probably an okay spot to stop it. We didn't end the new year on a, on a high note. Let's see. I, I got one uh, thing. I just want to touch on one more thing though, Russ, just so I know sure. you can jump in on this too. So the Eagles decide that they're going to flex their game on Saturday night to eight 15, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, two teams that really are really not playing for anything, but it's Dallas, Philadelphia, the flyers, they are still playing. I believe it's seven o'clock. I just wanted to give an update. Cause I had a tweet the other day. Apparently San Jose will not accommodate that. There was a Wings game, and my suggestion the other day was to move the Wings game to, say, 6 o'clock, play the Flyers game at noon. It's just for traffic. People misunderstand what I say. And I was, I'm not – no one was dissing the Wings, and I, I, yeah, I love the Wings. They're great. Go Wings. But uh, my point was <laughs> I was trying, to, was trying to figure out a way to, where to, to alleviate some of the, the, the vehicle traffic that was going into the building. And I, I don't know if the Flyers have made an effort at all to, to, to do it, but I did hear today San Jose will not accommodate that. Oh, Any word on your end about that ordeal? That's going to be a fun night down there Saturday. No, no. And, you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I do and I don't. I think at this point, we've now seen multiple instances where the Flyers and the Eagles are playing at the same time. We know that the last time this happened, the Flyers tried to move the game and the league wouldn't accommodate it. It was that ESP. I think it was the first game that was being exclusively streamed on ESPN+. Plus. Um, And it was it was supposed to be the game that was taking place right before the Christmas break where the league had said they're shutting down operations through the 26th, except for LL two games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So that I I will give the Flyers credit. They in the past have tried to move games. They have tried to accommodate. they've, They've tried their best to make things a little bit easier because they're not stupid. Like you go down there. What was the number one complaint when that when that Washington game got rescheduled? The the Washington football team game got rescheduled. Bunch of Eagles fans pissed off that they couldn't park at the Wells Fargo Center lot, right? So it doesn't behoove anybody to have both of these teams playing at the same time or, or an hour apart. 
realistically, the Eagles fans are going to move in. They're going to tailgate. It's going to be mad. It's going to be bedlam. And however many Flyers fans were going to go down, like if, if it were me, like I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to go down and cover that game. I refuse. I don't want to get stuck in that mess, nor do I want to get stuck in the post game mess. You know, it's worse than, than uh, drunk Eagles fans, drunk Eagles fans at night after a bad game. And that Eagles Cowboys game isn't going to be a great game friends on like, a Saturday on a Saturday. Right. So you're going to have a bunch of people binge drinking from the morning hours all the way up through a primetime game. And if by, you know, the grace of God, the flyers are done first, which they probably should be. You better book it out of there before the Eagles fans get out of the link. I'm not crapping on Eagles fans. I'm just pointing out the obvious. You don't want to be around when extra, how many 60,000, 70,000 people are trying to find their way home, whether it's the subway or uh, public transit or, or parking driving. So uh, yeah, not, not a great situation. If you're a Flyers fan to go down to that game, not a great situation. If you're an Eagles fan who usually parks at the Wells Fargo center lot. Um, I'm not surprised that San Jose isn't going to, uh, to do it or isn't going to accommodate it. It is disappointing though. I just wanted to look really quick because I didn't think to do this before. So the, the sharks are going to, that's the, the, that's the final game of their, their, that's the final game of their road trip. They're on a four game road trip that started with Pittsburgh. They went to Detroit. Uh, they've lost both of those games. They've got Buffalo tomorrow. And then they've got the flyers on Saturday. That's probably why they don't want to. The weird thing though, is the accommodating the earlier start, you would think that they want to get home sooner, right? Like it hasn't been a productive East coast swing for them. Odd. It's just an odd thing to do, but it's, here we are. It is a little odd. Um, so, all right. And last, Anything else? I got one more thing. One Ooh. more thing. One more thing. I'm bringing you the, so the Flyers play. This is I someone had told or mentioned this this morning. The Flyers play exclusively on ESPN Plus, I believe, this Thursday against the Penguins. Right. Uh-huh. Um, I wonder how many issues right. is, is that. The first exclusive. I, I. Well, that would be the first exclusive, at least for the Flyers. I don't know if that's the first the ESPN, ESPN exclusive Plus. game. So I was kind of laughing at, at the Giroux thing that I saw overnight where he couldn't watch a game in Anaheim or Provorov. Yeah, This is going to be, I promise you, by Friday morning, there is going to be more Flyers fans going cuckoo over the fact that they they didn't or they didn't know how to access the ESPN Plus package because the game's not yep. on TV. You've got to go on and watch it on the internet. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a serious thing for a lot of people. Uh, Vasilevsky said, I don't watch the games anymore. Andre Vasilevsky, because I don't have ESPN Plus. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I have ESPN Plus for my daughter's basketball games. <laughs> Hockey Aww, falls look in at there. You. What a good dad. Look at you. Uh, so I can give you this uh, this one little bit of, uh, of information. So ESPN Plus exclusive games uh, started last night with the Avalanche and Blackhawks, which was ESPN Plus and Hulu. Um, Penguins Flyers is ESPN Plus and Hulu as well. But then the game after Minnesota and Boston is going to be on ESPN or, or it's not even after it's at the same time, I believe, right there. Minnesota wild Boston Bruins on ESPN on Thursday is what it says. And the flyers and penguins are ESPN plus, mm, you know, I, I raved about the fact that ESPN got back into the hockey business and the off season. And I said, I was happy that like Turner picked up the other package. This ESPN exclusive thing is going to be a problem. I like the idea conceptually of saying every out of market game is available on ESPN plus, but when you start to do streaming exclusive games, you are cutting out a large part of your fan base. And if we're being real here, and I think we've talked about this before hockey fans, it's not as bad as baseball, but there are a lot of older hockey fans. There might not be as many young hockey fans in this market as there had been in the past. Like if, if you were to go to a, to like a a school event or something and see like, elementary, middle, high school age kids, chances are you're not going to see a lot of Flyers jerseys. You're not going to see a lot of Flyers paraphernalia as much as you would see Eagles, Sixers. Hell, even the Philadelphia Union are like doing, they're lapping the Flyers at this point with the youth, right? And so, uh, you know, it's great that this deal came through and that it it appears that it's going to be lucrative for the NHL, but it's leaving a lot of fans out in the cold. And the problem is this is a really big game. Flyers Penguins, regardless of where they're at in the standings is always a big game. And knowing that there are going to be thousands of people who are not going to be able to either access the game or aren't going to know that the game is happening on a streaming service. 
that's problematic. There's no other way to look at it. It's a shame. It's a bummer. You just have to hope that at some point cable integration, like the people who aren't cord cutters, are going to be able to access ESPN Plus through their boxes, which I, I believe Comcast and Fios both have. Um, but man, what a mess. That, that really is a mess of all the games. I get why you're trying to push it on ESPN Plus, but not allowing the, the local networks to carry the game is problematic. We'll see how it goes. I My guess is that Facebook, especially some of the Flyers groups are going to be a dumpster fire uh, once they realize that it's a, an, ex- an exclusive streaming. What I will say, and I'm not encouraging people to do this because of course I wouldn't, why would I, is Reddit is usually a pretty good place to find a stream of a game that's in market. Although if you're on Reddit, chances are you're a cord cutter and you already know how to access ESPN plus, but we'll just throw <laughs> it out there to the, uh, the random 70 year old man who's listening to the podcast. Who's on oh, Reddit, Russell, but has cable. Hey, <laughs> whippersnappers. All right. Well, there, we kind of ended on a somewhat more positive note. Uh, of course, we will have plenty of content going up on crossingbroad.com about every Flyers game that's happening. Uh, thanks for checking in. We're looking forward to another, you know, that we're looking forward to the new year. We're looking forward to continue things. I have to say, I don't know if you feel like this. I, I'm catching myself feeling like it's a chore to watch the team right now. I'm not finding it enjoyable to do. Um, I'm really hoping that if nothing else, this team goes one way or the other. Either they really turn things on, they LTIR Ellis, they make an acquisition, they start to get on a legitimate streak, or things don't go well, and we can start seeing some of the younger players get some meaningful NHL reps. We see Cam York work his way into the lineup once Yandel breaks the record, all those things. And at least it gives you something new to watch, something different to watch. I certainly hope that we're not going to be subjected to like 40 something more games of like bubble play. I don't know if that's how you feel. That's where I'm at right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I watch hockey for entertainment, all sports as well. And I haven't been entertained much lately. So Again, it's they're not alone in this. There's a lot of teams like that, but man, I'll tell you what, it's it's tough when you're, you know, at game whatever it is, 35, 33, whatever, and uh, you know, you're this far behind the eight ball. Even though the playoffs are kind of like right there to grab, but it's it dep- depends on Boston. I, I think that's the biggest problem for a team, Russ, at this time of year is how far back they are at yeah. this stage in the game. Because you know, if you're right there or you're up in the playoff spot, it's kind of hard to lose that. Uh, and I always, I've always felt, you know, chasing the second half um, has been very, very tough. This team's been chasing the decade in a lot of ways. You know, like they've fallen behind so many times. They've come back. They, they have battled back into a playoff spot. But it's going to be very, very difficult uh, set of circumstances to do it this year. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how the team does this week. And, of course, we'll be back next week unless something else happens. There's some kind of crazy breaking news that happens around the league or around the team. We'll come back with an emergency show. But I, I think – It's probably safe to say that will not happen. Fingers crossed. We don't need any kind of chaos. Hopefully the NHL will continue to get these games played. Maybe they'll revise the the COVID protocol. We'll see. We don't know. We are the only Flyers podcast. We are talking about it. So, of course, this will go right to Gary Bettman, and uh, he can take everything that we say and, um, you know, implement changes from there. So when things eventually do change, just remember you heard it first here on Snow the Goalie. And we have the commissioner's ear. So for Bundy, find him on Twitter at Cetarian6. I'm Russ at Joy on Broad. Of course, as I said before, Anthony is on Twitter at Ant San Philly. You can find the show on Twitter and Instagram at Snow the Goalie. You can find us on Facebook.com slash Snow the Goalie. You can find this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts. The wild thing, Bundy, is the listener numbers. Even though the team is whatever the hell it is, the listener numbers keep going up. And I've been getting more and more reports from some of these other podcast apps like Google Podcasts. Our numbers were were up a ton. I don't know why. Uh, Spotify, big boom. Amazon Music, we've seen people checking in, which I'm honestly a little bit surprised by. I don't know how many people listen to podcasts on Amazon Music, but we're there. We're available. Uh, We'll continue to put the show out on every podcast app that we possibly can. And of course, you can watch the episode, although it's not up as early as the podcast feed itself. You can watch over on youtube.com slash crossing broad. Look for the snow, the goalie playlist, and you can watch I, us. I, you can look into Bundy's eyes. You're certainly welcome, Russ, for the growing podcast. And uh, it's been my pleasure. <laughs> it's all about you, buddy. All about you. 
Hundo percent. It's I the love Bundy. both it's you the, guys. Don't the, ever it's forget the Bundy that. Boost. It's the bu- it's the Bundy bump. That's what we're gonna call it. And no, I'm not There's talking about the COVID like the COVID nineteen. I've gained the COVID nineteen. I don't know about you. Can I call this the Bundy like self promotion? Self promotion uh, is, uh, is is great. Yes, Russ. Great show today, buddy. We'll catch up next week. Good talking to you, pal. All right, go thanks Flyers, for tuning go in. Go Wings, go Eagles. That's right, go Wings. All right, we'll talk to you again next week here on Snow the Goalie.